Another episode of the Best Damn League show. Dom and I have returned. Now, to be fair, it's not actually Dom's fault that we didn't do a show last week. I was actually uncharacteristically ill. I mean, look, I'm sick all the time, but that was like a rare time <laughs> where it got to me. You know, I actually had to lie in bed and ponder life and what was going on. I didn't really. I just waited a few days. Don't worry, I was still on Twitter. The one thing I did was, I'm a bit like Dom. I I. I we hate like we breathe. It's just a bodily function. So I still was on Twitter sometimes to like roast certain organizers. I say certain organizers, just got to realize Peter's here, so I can't say the obvious ones that I roast a lot, you know, and make fun <laughs> of, but spoiler. At this point in time, the joke is, without saying the name of that org, have they thought of just actually letting ChatGPT run the org? Like at this point, you know, I don't know if the results could be any worse. I'm just saying. <laughs> and and the merch would probably be better. The tech, I've given it away there, haven't I? I've given away who it is I'm referring to. But don't worry <laughs> about that. We have to get back into it. Because at the beginning of this episode, everyone's going to have to just chill for a second. Because we like hot takes here. But we like hot takes, not least because we're just fragile internet influencers. We like hot takes when they come out of our mouths, not when they go into them. Nobody enjoys hot, irritating smoke coming in when you're trying to enjoy cannabis. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? Don't answer anyone. No one in this call answer. Everyone do full poker face. You don't know what I'm referring to. Basically, when I smoke cannabis, though, I want it to just be a smooth, enjoyable experience. I don't want to be... <coughs> And then have that guy next to you like, it's good. When you cough, it means it's getting deep. It's working. It's good. Like, we're not 14 <laughs> anymore, basically. So as an adult, I can also use my disposable income to improve my cannabis smoking experience. Like, for example, with the freeze pipe available at thefreezepipe.com, 10% off with the code LFN. Because they have their food safe glycerin chamber, which we take it out, put it into the freezer section for a mere hour. It cools smoke afterwards by over 200 degrees, therefore giving you quite an easy experience on the throat. You just get to enjoy all the upside of cannabis without any of the downsides. As I often say, make your cannabis smoking experience a cannabis smoking experience. Also, <laughs> they do have some new products. They have the pen. So if you don't want any smoke at all, that, that, that works off vape. It's actually vapors. So they have a little vape cartridge thing that you put in there and it just you push your button. It's a bit like one of those old cartoons. One button does everything. You just press one button, it opens the thing. One button, oars a ramp. Shout out the old X-Men cartoons in the 90s if you know what I'm talking about. They used very cheap animation techniques, believe it or not. And also, they have the blunt tip, which isn't just like, spoiler, when it comes back, I should probably work that in with some sort of angle on esports bet like a blood tip or something, but I haven't got anything for that now. Basically, if you like to smoke <laughs> blunts or joints, it's a way of cooling that down. You take that little thing, put it in there for only 20 minutes, and it'll cool it down, and you can smoke your handheld, but you also get to have less of the irritating smoke. 10% off with the code Thorin. Not Thorin. Definitely don't use the code Thorin. Thorin is telling you the code LFN for 10%. Ah, uh, that okay. one there. It's, maybe I enjoyed too much of the products myself time and time, you know, but whatever. <laughs> All that matters now is we're here. Because basically, I'll tie this into the show because don't worry, I'm back with props again. You know, we had the uh, chicken on a skateboard. Remember that? We had the chicken on the skateboard yep, with legendary. the Maho. Then we had that, like, sheep, where I tried to tell CL, don't be a sheep. Don't just buy into the, all the narratives, you know. Got a new one. Got another friend back from the gang. See this little guy, this little rabbit here? First of all, he fucking loves a freeze pipe. Look at those eyes, homie. And then secondly, <laughs> like all good gamers, and like me... Oh, I know he likes weed. Look, he's on grass right now. He's on grass right now. He's touching grass. But here's the thing. He's not just touching grass. He's above it all, though, isn't he? He sort of transcended the negatives of grass. He's getting all the upside and all those positive ions. I don't even know if that's what goes on when you touch grass in the whole ground. I'm going to pretend it is, though. He's got all the positive ions. Not a scientist. And basically, look at him. He's just living his best life. He's moisturized. He's just above it all, taking it all in, enjoying it all, but not getting too bothered. Uh -oh. You know, in many ways. And basically, here's the one message for you, Peter. Don't rab it on too much this episode. Just keep it, you know, concise, short, good. Because here's the thing. At the beginning, before we start, I do have one question to ask you, Pete, which is this. Obviously, spoiler, there is no heretics at the season finals. We will do a discussion about some of your thoughts on the team and how the year went and all that jazz. But I will just say at the beginning... There is no universe in which, while Peter is the coach now, I can actually ask him, right, so what happened with that CL guy? Why is he not there anymore? Like, that's not going to be a conversation at this point in time. Like, that is just something in the background that we will ignore and go, hey, keep, shut the fuck up there, elephant. We're trying to have a convo here about the team at Reddit. So we're not going to get into that. There's no drama needed on this. Well, there'll be loads of drama. We'll be out the other teams, not about us. So, Peter, what are your initial... Let's just get it out of the way. What do you think about the way the Heretics year went overall? 
Like to me, I actually noticed the way you've messaged is very different from a lot of other orgs. Like you've kind of messaged as well, actually the kind of level you've got to is maybe even like above expectations for the first year. And you kind of have like, isn't it like you have a two year plan or something where making worlds would be next year's main goal, right? Yeah, I mean, when we came in, it was a two-year plan, but obviously we're ex incredibly disappointed uh, to not be going further than we are. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot more in-depth discussion about heretics, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe coming in, our plan was to have a two-year plan, but at the point where you sign Yankos, you're not having a two-year plan anymore, right? Like, right. You know, sure. uh, in the same... I mean, it's it's not it's not even about uh, cost. It's about you know it's disrespectful to a to a legend of the game to not put a roster around him that can compete. Um, and obviously, Yankos was the last person that we put into our roster. You know, he was literally the last person we signed. Um, and you know, we made changes appropriately, and the changes didn't have a big impact for us to compete. Um, but I felt basically, um, you know, we had a shift of plan in the middle of the year. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure lots of people have heard the rumors. I mean, Bwipo went on a show and basically talked about a lot of the things that were happening in the last off season. Um, and yeah, uh, basically what I would say is that, uh, I think we kind of underperformed, uh, what, uh, what I would have hoped for, uh, coming into, coming into summer split, but, uh, yeah, it's just generally a very disappointing year. You can't be happy with a year where you came eighth, ninth and fourth. Like that's, that's not a good year right so, so yeah that's all i put on that okay right here's the thing dom we already did the full like soviet gulag interrogation of cl about mm -hmm. maybe so i feel like we don't have to we don't we have the to same thing that peter we don't well. have to do that again yeah we also did it with him as well. so we've already we don't we're not gonna do that again guys we've spoiled them you can go look at the classics they're all there in the can you know like <laughs> go, go check them out there's, there's some great work there who did better defense you'll have to decide that yourselves but they're obviously you must have some questions about her ex right dom what do you want to know about i mean it, it feels weird because all the questions that i've had i feel like i've already asked you know like the, the evy signing the ruby signing you know like getting some of those like veteran players and, and like the response originally was that um last time you're on the show peter the response was that you know you do have rookie players that you were bringing up which at the time it was like jack and and mersa but then like ruby was replaced with, with video and then jack was re was replaced with uh flocking so i guess my main question would be when did the mentality change into like a more get results now from a develop like the young players have some veterans and like develop you know jack into a, a player that could be like really good for example next year that i, I, I think, think that's you're a muted. good thing because oh no, 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 it's all good it's just a bit it, I think it cameras a bit like but don't worry keep going your voice is coming through clear it's all good so i could talk about that i think it also fits a little bit into the heavy stuff as well so i think it, it maybe is a bit useful on that um basically um i will say um, about Ruby and Jack, and I don't think either of those guys are bad players. I think Ruby was kind of yeah. doomed from the start. I, I of think December. Ruby's a bad player, but you know. Okay, okay, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Um, <laughs> but what I will say about Ruby is the best way I can describe Ruby is um, we had a game where Ruby was on rise, and uh, it was against uh, Evie was on Trindamir, and we were like 5k gold up at 18 minutes. And he Pulling the game perfectly, everything was going well. He was roaming with his rise. I didn't agree with every play he did with his rise, but you know he's he's really talkative. And then eight into the game, it's in. I remember the exact game. It was in spring. It was against uh, Koi. Uh, he dies for no reason in a bush, trying to be really really aggressive, and that's fine. At the point where he dies, he doesn't talk for the rest of the game. He just literally doesn't say a word for the rest of the game. And there's a similar situation in the Mad Lions uh, in the Mad Lions series. Uh, the the playoff against Mad Lions to get into groups. He's on Tilia. Mm -hmm. He messes up a top, and then he goes from being super talkative, really, really being decisive what he wants, and then he just doesn't talk for the rest of the game. Um, and yeah. so he's to, Korean to me. Uh, I, 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 Impact was never like that. Impact talked more when he was. Uh, when yeah. he was Im behind. Impact is <laughs> is different. He's he's a different beast. Um, but essentially, so so. This to me, this was different to what he was doing on Unicorns of Love. It was so it was a bit of a surprise um, when we saw. Uh, and the, the one thing I would say about Jack is, look, I think Jack is one of the top ten mechanical, and I don't mean that as a you know meme. He's like number ten. No, I think he's one of the ten best. You know, probably even one of the seven or six or seven best uh, right now as a rookie uh, mechanical AD carries in Europe. But as 
And I say this because he's our player and, you know, he's about to play a tournament in Iberia Cup. And this is the thing which will determine whether Jack can be a future star of the LEC or not. If he is not vocal at all about his wave, which means nice. that whenever your team <clears throat> plays away from him, he, oh, he, he just gets, he, he gets dove and he gets really, really far behind. And this is one of the reasons why when he's on Draven, when he's on Lucian, when he's on Callista, the game looks really easy. He had like a game on Draven, right. I think against Excel, where we won the game in like mm -hmm. 20 minutes. And that was him literally nonstop talking all the time. But uh, the situation with Jack uh, is that either it's a lack of knowledge or it's a lack of confidence. But this is the thing that is stopping him being like a top tier player. And if you look at if you look at Heretics in the ERLs, in playoffs, when they lost to Fin Network Koi, uh, the Spanish Koi team, um, the enemy team just target him. Every single time we go to Herald, they just target him on bot lane. And I know that he's not communicating about his wave. To me, it was never a mechanical issue that was holding him back. It was a voice comm issue. And this is why he just couldn't develop in the environment we had. And if you actually look at Mercer, you look at Evie, why they put better in summer split it's not because it's not because it's because they they now have a mid laner who's really really vocal he vincent v vto wants everyone mid whenever they can possibly be and black and never stops talking so it's much easier to to play in that kind of environment and to be clear i think jack will develop that but i mean look at iberia cup which will happen in two months from now and if if things are different, then then you'll see a, a very much improved Jack. But you know, you, you've seen we've seen Jack. His team fighting is insane. He really knows what to do uh, in kind of the mid to late game. But he gets himself really really far down every single game, and it's purely a communication issue. Um, and we weren't able to fix that. And trust me, lots and lots of things were tried. Like we tried we tried playing against easier teams, you know, like lower teams. We scrimmed Czech teams, we scrimmed Italian teams, you know, just to, to try to build build the framework up from scratch. But for whatever reason, uh, it just never went through on stage and he just needs more practice in that area and he'll develop and I'm sure he'll be really, really great uh, later on uh, when he when it finally clicks. So I, I think I think those were the, those were the real reasons behind the two tra changes. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's all I kind of had to say about that. When you have, again, when you have Yankos in your team, you can't afford to just sit around and wait for these things to click, right? Like, you know, I, I believe League of Legends players will play way into their 30s, okay, right? At, at some point in the future. But, like, I can't just have Yankos on my team sitting around waiting. And to be clear, Yankos never caused any problems behind the scenes. You know, he's like the perfect teammate. He's the, he, he's like a really, really great in-game leader. But at the same point, you can feel you can feel it sometimes, and um, I think that that is uh, I think that was our responsibility as an org and my responsibility as a coach not to continue a project like that. I think that's what I would say. Okay, interesting answers there. Basically, if people that were, can't want to make it concise, it wasn't just gameplay related things. It was things like who has a voice in the team and how does that affect the style of play, etc. Which, by the way, I do think is always the underrated part. And it's not that like me and Dom are idiots. It's that we aren't in the team, so we can't know these dynamics, etc. So we we are sometimes just judging on who plays a better Siver in a certain matchup or why didn't this person who carried the team fight get to stay in the team? Because obviously, I would say actually, I thought Jack Spectre looked like one of, uh, with Yankos was the best player in the team from the outside but I can understand in this case why that might make the game more limited if he's not speaking very much I'll I'll segue this to the obvious other name which is it's already enough that you got Yankos out of nowhere that's like a gift from the gods just being handed a player like that available at the point where heretics were because if people don't know he could and maybe should have been in some of the much bigger name teams for much more money but then the other one obviously was when mid-season you made the switch to pick up Vethi or Vethi or however you want to pronounce it depending on if you're French or not now here's what's funny Peter, everyone now is going to all claim, because I know what people are like, no, no, I always thought he was good, I thought he was just having a bad time in X, no, no, everyone was down on this guy, mate, As people were telling me stuff like, like that it meant all the Misfits period was a fraud, and you know, he was like, I don't know, carried by the jungler, or it was just the way he was, set, or it was just, like, people were actually telling me, you know, ironically, just because Yumi was in the game that he did all those carry games, like, so... A lot of other people actually completely backed out and retconned history on VTO. Obviously, you took the gamble and you brought him in, and I would say it paid off pretty well. Like He looked like a much better player immediately. It seems like, actually, he brought something interesting to the dynamic, right, Peter? Because a lot of people speculated in XL, right? Is it that no one in this team speaks, or does no one know what they want, or does everyone sit back? Like, What, what would you say it's been like to work with VTO? What, what's your sense of what you have to do to, to make him be this a really good mid laner as opposed to the fairly humdrum one he was in XL? 
about Vito is he's is very very conflict driven. He is he he, he likes, likes it, right? the, okay. he loves it and like I would say Yankos Yankos likes it too and Flacken 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 can go both ways but Flacken kind of likes it too. Like they're really really direct and there are things that I've heard uh, say about each other which uh, I will not repeat here. But basically they're willing to be really really frank. And they're willing to be really really direct, right? And that doesn't work on every single team. You know, there's some teams where you need kind of a uh, Everyone needs to be best friends, right? And I'm not, like, obviously Flackard and Yankos are really, really close friends, but on this Heretics, nobody needs to be friends, right? Like, as long as we come in, we, we all work hard, we all know we're going towards the same goals, and we go and, you know, like, we go and hang out afterwards, right? Like, it doesn't matter. Like, the fact that they are they were friends is something that they developed over the course of the split, but nobody came in like that. Like that. Our first scrims at the start were, like, our reviews were, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Like, going really, really hard. And basically, you know, the Excel roster that they had, you know, Zerxe, Patrick, uh, I don't, well, Odo is quite, it, like, likes his discussion, but, but Patrick and Zerxe are definitely more the conflict averse type of players. So I can see how, you know, when you have Odo and Vito and you have Patrick and Zerxe, I can see how it would have been difficult on Excel. That's what I would say. But on Heretics, you know, they, these are exactly the type of guys that I love to work with. You know, people like Inspired, people like Impact, you know, don't, I, do, I, I dislike it when a player automatically assumes that the coach is always right or, you know, they, they have their opinion, they're going to go hard on their opinion and you just have to prove, you have to justify your po your point of view. And I think that's that's kind of why heretics worked because a lot of the, everyone on the team understood this and they were willing to go hard, right? And I think, I think that was a good thing. Okay. Now I've got one last question that we'll actually jump into the season finals and all the other teams. The last question goes like this. I'm actually very interested to know what stylistically you were trying to do with Heretics in this last split, the summer split, Peter, because one thing I've noticed about your teams is it's in line with the way you explained the different personalities and the, the balance of like types of player in your team. You didn't just say whether someone's good or bad. I've noticed in your teams, they always have like an identity and a playing style that comes from the personnel. So if people don't know, look, obviously there was a negative later consequence to this, but we'll just, you, we'll stick to the example for now if people ever saw when Danny was an evil geniuses the difference between the first split he was in like summer or whatever it was 2021 and later when they had the George all was very different the way he was used in the team and the way he was like set up to be a carry or not a carry or what, whether he was hidden on the map or you I thought it was very interesting the way you like decided which way to go depending on the person of the team so with this team people might remember early on when this Herex team was getting these wins you had all these like quite interesting teleport players that the team keep making like what was the vision behind so what were, what were you seeing in the game it seemed like you were the only team making these players mate uh, we played through our most vocal members um i'll be honest like we had a different strategy in the best of ones to the best of threes and best of fives uh but basically flackard was incredibly vocal um and you know th there was the interesting stat that was on the broadcast i think dom i saw it on your twitter actually because i was watching the game uh, i was obviously backstage but where they had the stat where evie was 10th in forward percentage, 10th in goal differential, yep. and third in jungle proximity. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which is like the most damning stat line possible. Because if you think about what that means, that means that he is like sure. getting played around permanently. Like he's one of the most played around players. And then he's also just permanently behind as well. But yes. So, so yeah. So actually, uh, I, I can actually kind of explain that. So I was kind of, so I don't have access to the 14 uh, minutes, but at Oracle's Elixir releases the stats at 10 minutes, right? Okay. And there is a mm -hmm. massive gap between um, eighth and tenth, eighth to tenth, it's three tiers. Okay, there's one and two, which are Finn and uh, Finn and Photon. Then three, seven, who are all like almost the same stats, and then eight, nine, and ten are Adam, Broken Blade, and Evie. Right, and it's about how their teams use their top laners. Um, so, doing basically in the early game is Jankos would go top, he would get Evie an early game lead. Uh, we would then. Uh, at 10 minutes, always look to TP towards bot. Uh, and that's where the jungle proximity is coming from, right? He's ganking top early. He's getting him a lead. Uh, we use Herald if we choose to play for Herald. So that's more jungle proximity. And basically, Evie's job is not is never to win his lane. Whenever he has an advantage, his his job is to go into the jungle, track the enemy jungle, so that when we see... Because you know how jungle camps respawn, right? So if we see enemy jungle uh, at 8 minutes on top side, we know that in 2 minutes, he's going to be back top side again, right? So we're just going to TP bot every single time, and we're already looking to set up the wave and do that. And that's what we did in... That was kind of our set play in regular season. It worked for a lot of games. It also explains why his goal difference is so, is so low, because he's always looking for those kind of plays. Um, obviously, he had a few bad games. He, his, his game against Excel was really poor. Like Odo really kind of got him in that game. Um, but but every but 
every game where top was getting ahead, we were using that to play into bot. It's like Fnatic in 2020. Into playoffs, we switched our strategy a bit because we knew in order to go to Worlds, we had to play against BDS and we had to play against Fnatic. Uh, and both of those teams are teams that want to play mid into bot. Um, so the way that we were playing there was to neutralize bot lane um, and to then use support room into mid. And, you know, the meta was AD mids, you know, like uh, Kai'Sa, um, Tristana, Jace. Uh, and that's why we were playing all those AP champions bot lane. It was so that we could neutralize bot, play into mid, uh, and then uh, give Vincent ahead. Um, we kind of shied away from that in the second Fnatic series, and actually I, I'm kind of disappointed that we did that, to be honest. Uh, but how scrims were going and how the team felt, uh, we kind of we kind of switched, switched up our style to just go more standard, you know, playing Ari into Jason, things like this, instead of Tristana or Lucian. Um, so it's kind of my regret of the season, because if you look at Noah, the champions at Noah is He's really, really good on things like Aphelios. He's really good on Aphelios. He's really good on Zaya. Those are champions where if you're playing Ziggs, if you're playing Seraphine, those champions are really, really good into those types right. of champions, right? So that's what we were trying to do, but we didn't we didn't follow through. And um, that one of my that's my big regret from this year, if I had to say so. Let's do it. Let's just jump in the other teams, Dom. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing I would want to say on that, though, before we move on, um, is... That I feel like it's pretty convenient because Evie was also like not a strong laner in the first two splits. And then TP was changed to be like, a, you know, a 10 minute summoner spell where now you could influence bot as opposed to like a 14 minute post lane phase, post plating um, summoner spell. So I feel like it is it is pretty convenient that it's like, oh, well, our strategy was just for Evie to TP bot. It's like, well, that was impossible in the first like two splits. And there was no knowledge that it would actually like become a viable strategy or that like the game would change in that fundamental way. Firstly, Evie's laning stats weren't bad in winter, right? Like, I mean, he, he got Cassante every game. Sure, yeah, but his, he, as soon as people yeah, started banning Cassante, they got yeah. bad. Sure, of, of, uh, ah, sure. But I mean, but in spring, why were his stats bad in spring? It's because basically we wanted to play. We had this issue in our team where if we didn't find a way to cover bot lane, any team would just play through bot, right? Um, and so we played a lot of strategies where Evie was on something like he was on a Scion or he was on a Gragas and he, he can't play those champions very, very well, right? Like he's never been those, that type of a player. And we, you, we use that to kind of bridge. So we would just say top lane, go sit on an island. And we're just going to go and play into bot. Uh, and that was our strategy. That was our strategy in spring. Uh, now obviously the TP, the TP timers made a huge difference, right? But the big difference would have been. Flacken would have come in. He would have had. He he has really really good comms. And then we could have put Flacken more on weak side and played into into top more. If we if if that had been the meta, if the TP if playing into top had become more important, that's how we would have gone and played. So so I think it's it's a mixture of the rest of the other team. But just remember that we played the first two splits. Yankos being the baller and doing ninety percent of our comms. And uh, it's really hard if you're somebody that doesn't speak English as a first language to be able to come and play strong side like this when, when you're not receiving any information. Okay, And I think, I think that's, that's what I would say on Evie. Um, and I would say that's one of the reasons why it looked really, really hard for Evie. Um, and I just want to be really, really clear on this. I think that that is something that maybe I should have foreseen more as a rookie with, with like Ruby and Jack coming into the team. I should have foreseen it more. But when you look at their comms on Unicorns of Love or Heretics, uh, Heretics LVP, like you look at Jack's comms last year, you look at uh, uh, you look at Ruby's comms on on Unicorns of Love when their jungler or their top laner isn't playing for them properly, they're like going hard on their jungler. Like when Blue Rizzer like doesn't play for bot lane properly, uh, last split is last last year. Sorry, Jack is going like you know I need you now, right? Like and that just didn't happen, right? So so I would say I would say that. I would say that this is that this is kind of an issue. It's a mistake that we as a coaching staff made. It's a mistake that uh, maybe, you know, we could have handled the team better. Maybe we could have um, managed how they do with comms better. Maybe we could have had better practice. Maybe we could have better had, you know, there's tens of different things that we could have done. But this is, this is the reality of, of the situation. And, you know, when Evie finally was in a team where he, he other people were coming and he, he had comfort within the team, he actually played better. He played better in the groups good in our series against Fnatic. He wasn't insane. He was good. And he had a good, when we, he had simple set plays to go for, it was shot calling. It was micro, was, you can say micromanaging, but was, you know, we had things that we practiced in scrims. He was able to execute them. Right. I mean, that, that's all I say. That's all I say on that situation. Right. Uh, like it, we would have done something different if TP's hadn't changed. 
Thing is, Dom, I don't really care about the heavy topic, mate. The reason why I say that is one, we've milked all the comedy from it. And so basically, <laughs> it's not like it's not like he himself and his coaching staff have pretended he's really good, Dom. This isn't like the bullshit when like people actually unironically in his first split were trying to gaslight us that like Adam was already better than Wonder and like a complete top lane. Like that is egregious. That does deserve like infinite fucking like inquisitions and trials and all that. In this case, like <laughs> He can't change the lineup. So in my opinion, look, if Dom, if Peter isn't here, I mean, he's here, but I'll say it anyway. I would obviously just say fire Revy and get a different player. I don't really give a fuck about that one. It's pretty open and shut for me. But Peter has to just work with what yeah. he's got, doesn't he? He's just, just work. And quite frankly, he's working miracles, mate. So, you know, I mean, what, what at this point in time, like Peter needs to spend all his time working on actual strategy for heretics. He can't put like 10 hours a day into like creative strategies for explaining why Evie gets to steal the team. <laughs> There's no time for that, mate. He's got a second all full-time job. So I think we'll just move on now. Let's get into the actual season finals. So first things first, we only missed one fucking week and Excel's already out. This is so underwhelming. It's fucking whack. Because if there's one <laughs> thing you could give Excel the credit for after the summer split when they were coming into the season finals, I kept harping on it myself was, mate, the floor of the team was really impressive. Like, I didn't think they had, like, an exceptional team with great style. They, they played their style well, but the floor of the team, it's just like they never had bad games generally. They were always in the games. It was always going decently. They could always get a lane go. This is this season finals was fucking terrible, mate. The idea they're out already, it's like that's just whack. Like they got absolutely murked by Mad Lions. It was pathetic. And then this Fnatic series, like they just don't want to win, Dom. Like this it this was absolute garbage. Like, you know, one of the things that really bums me out is I don't like it on the show when we figure out like cynical bands. Like, you know, the one we the famous example is Misfits, where we're just like, if I was the coach, I would have just banned like basically or the you plus you me plus like if it was like so, so, like whatever. Garner or something, you, you know, like the three champions you were about, or the top player, like you're saying, hmm. it's obvious what you would ban. The sad thing is, this is another ter European team that's been near the top, that's a bit again being figured out. Like, as soon as you cynically drafted, they were just half as good. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. Also, I think that their own drafts, like the way that they would draft, they didn't cynically draft against opponents the way I thought that they should have in yeah. these series. Like, when I was watching, the, the thing that I thought was so confusing um, was that they kept on going to this, like, LeBlanc ban that Humanoid wasn't playing, and it was also getting blue side banned by Fnatic. So Fnatic didn't even show that they were, like, willing to play that pick, and it was just removed the entire series. You combine that with the fact that you had so long to prepare for the season finals, and teams just yeah. didn't pick up core meta champions. Like, across the board, it feels like the, the, the break was almost useless. Like, why can every team not play Ivern at this point? It's been good for a while. It, it's it's something that is... Things have been working on that break as well. It's the champion, right? Yeah, and you and these teams can't play it. So, like, they can't play it. They they didn't use their break well at all. And then when you watch the games that, that, that they're playing, it's like... The way that teams carry out their leads is just so poor across Europe right now. It, it doesn't feel streamlined at all. Like, if you get early kills, it should just be, like, early kill. Okay, we, like, won the early game. That's, like, the hardest part of the game. Now we just, like, take Dragon with our prio. Then we rotate. We, we take Herald when we have the ability to. Like, it should be a very easy game to play out. And I just feel like there's just a lack of this, like, discipline or just knowledge on how to progress games um, across most of the teams. That's why I've been, like so disappointed and then xl i mean i feel like they've also just lost um like a lot of their their charm i mean peach is, was was just playing like objectively worse than he was um and then like abadage with with his champion pool being figured out and teams like not letting him get his ear as much I, I felt like it just became one of those things where xl they they didn't like obviously after playing so many games teams are going to have a good read on them what is your response to that read going to be? Like, it felt like they should have had, like, plan B, plan C just already lined up, but it, it felt like there was just nothing going for them, like, in, you know, this the season finals. And even the games they won, I didn't even, felt like, I didn't even feel like they should have won those games. I felt like the only games they won are games they stole. Go on, Peter, what do you think of XL? They tested in, in Summer Split. Like, let's have a look at the games they played against, okay? So Mad Lions finished the season 0-5, right? They'd already hmm. qualified for season finals. Um, so they beat them. They then played again the day after it was announced that SK had already made season finals. Then in the best of fives, they played against Fnatic, who clearly, like, I can say this from Heretic's perspective, Heretic's, we, we just focus on Fnatic for that week, right? Because that's what we needed to do. We needed to come third to make season finals. Same sort of thing. I'm, I would guess 
and what Fnatic showed against us that we were their main preparation, right? So those are the teams that they played against, and they had that one series against G2, which was pretty close, like the 3-2 series, right? But XL have gone 2-9 over their last three series. And, you know, it makes me question. It, they were never forced to out of their comfort zone when a team was prepping specifically for them, right? With the focus that we must beat this team in order to, to go forward. And I think I think you mentioned the Azir thing. I think that's right. I think that this was one of those post-seasons where Odo, like, when Odo was able to get the insane engages on Nar, when he was able to find those moments, they were able to do things, right? But when I look at Pat in these playoffs, the way that he's contesting mid-wave, he just gives the mid-wave. Like, he has numbers advantage mid, watching um, Trimby and Noah just take the mid-wave off him every single time. And this leads to Limit dying in the jungle. It leads to Peach lead dying in the jungle. Game 5, they're so far ahead uh, of the game. What he has to do is step up on the mid-wave, stop uh, Noah being able to push him out and go and collapse into side lane bush. And Fnatic can't can't get those Baron setups. And he, they just backed off. And Abadagi was a little bit to blame for this, but it was mainly Patrick. And it was really, really disappointing in the Fnatic series. Because I think that, you know, if Patrick, if you had Patrick from best of ones in summer, they would have beaten Fnatic in that series. You know, Oscar had his hand injury, right? So so he was playing through his, his, his injury and it kind of showed. Um, but yeah, the Mad series, I think Mad Lions, uh, in fairness, not Mad, Mad played reasonably well when they had a lead. You know, they had Camille. They weren't forcing fights when, when you know, they, they, they played a LeBlanc-Camille game in the third Third, third game, you know, they're kind of dancing on the limit with with Camille. They're not, they're not for, they, you know, they're hitting towers with LeBlanc. You know, playing, baiting on the map. I thought they played that game really, really well. Um, whereas you look at kind of Fnatic, Fnatic had situations where they had a Tristana pushing the side lane, and then they're just fighting four v five, and then just can't even doesn't even position to TP. So I, th I think Mad Lions played reasonably well uh, in the XL series, but I think yeah, for for me XL. Yeah, it might be like the only team that played well because even like G2's wins, like I, I wasn't very impressed with G2's wins, like considering the level that I'm holding them to, like the standard that I have for them is that they need to shit on Europe. Like they need to just absolutely destroy Europe. So they go interna international and they actually look like they're, you know, above the, the rest of the Western teams. And, and when I was watching the, the G2 series, it once again just felt like they shouldn't win at least that game four. Like the game four, they ended up closing it out. Like that just felt like a, a lost game, you know, the, the, the Trundle game um, as well. So I, I, that's like, I guess, where my overall sentiment comes from is like maybe, okay, maybe one team out of this, the six we've seen has looked good. I just, it's not, it's, it's not enough for me right now. What is weird? In, by the way, Peter, in in scrims, was XL actually like the team that they seemed like in summer? Did they were they a much improved squad? Were they actually like beating people? Okay, so uh, G two were scrim team number one by far for the entire season, but XL was scrim team number two. Even when they were all oh, right, they were okay. Team two. Um, but I think the gap between second and third was much larger in in summer than it was in the previous splits. And I will tell you, Patrick in scrims is the best lady carry in the league by like a mile. Like you okay. know. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, so that's kind of what I would say about Excel. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't really understand what happened. Uh, it just kind of felt that Fnatic, you know, <laughs> about Trimby and <laughs> Razork, you know, they're not afraid to look stupid, right? Like they're, they're, they're willing to go in, they're willing to force the plays, and you know, they were willing to take the risks, right? Whereas it felt that sometimes on Excel, they were waiting for Odo to do something all the time. And that, that, that's that's what it looked like for me, for Excel. And you can't win, you can't go to Worlds, right? If you're just going to sit there and let the other team take everything in front of you. So. My one sort of closing note on Excel goes like this, because then we'll get into like all the other teams that are more interested to talk about. It goes like this. I, th I think in a perverse, counterintuitive way, the way they failed this season finals is actually the best thing that could happen to this specific lineup. Because <laughs> after they had that like second place where they thought like, well, you almost beat G2 in the upper finals. That's where you can get so baited into thinking like, we should just keep this lineup. Like it's got real potential. It could develop like... I, I think you already saw the, the the heights of what this lineup was capable of. And even then it was fairly capped. It was never in the actual official games I saw ever looking world-class. It just looked like when the rest of the LEC was bad, like I said, the floor was good and it was just in, they had in a decent draft set up, some half decent macro and they could win some games. Like I think it would have been a nightmare to bring back most of this lineup. I hope they actually really just, for real, I would be insanely cynical. I would just pick like two players and just restart for next year. I would just redo it all over 
over again. Pick whoever the ones you like. If, if you like Abadaga, pick him. If you want to keep Ordo, I assume he's on a big cut, take him. But you've got to rebuild the rest of the squad. Like, like the two, like, I know it's as everyone's talking there, two of the players that just, as the team went down, they just went down the drain with the fucking jungle and support. You're not going to, why, why would I even don't want a team with Peach and Limit as the jungle and support to go to Worlds? Like, I, I mean, Peach is one that... I don't want everyone to get destroyed. Like, it's just look whack. It just looked bad at the end, mate. It looked bad. I mean, I think that Limit is more excusable. I think that the pairing of Limit with Patrick makes sense because it felt like Patrick just needs somebody who's going to like make plays for him. Like when you saw him play with Targamas and they both like didn't really know what they wanted to do in lane, it just looked so like, I don't know, just like they looked so apprehensive playing together. It was really tough to, to watch. Whereas, you know, sometimes you need, if you have like a player who's more stable, like for example, the, the upset Hilly pairing, I feel like this is kind of just a a weak version, a poor man's version of the upset hilly pairing from Fnatic, where you have like the, the, the inter paired with like the guy that that's actually going to be consistent and like make use of the kill. So I think the limit angle, I could see him coming back. I don't see what Peach brings. And I think that Peach got bailed out so hard by the meta switch. When you saw how he looked in the first couple weeks when it was like Vi Wukong meta, he looked terrible like it looked like he couldn't actually play the game and then when you go to like Maokai Sejuani I mean this is maybe one of the easiest jungle metas we've ever had in competitive to be the worst jungler and and still win games on like if you're playing Maokai Sejuani Rel and you don't actually have to care you know Ivern you don't really actually have to care about you know your own pathing it's more just like showing up to the right places at the right time making the right set plays there's not that like that jungle intuition that comes into play where you're you're you know going to war with the enemy jungler and if you lose like a camp here a camp there it could be like catastrophic for for example before it was your divine sunderer timing that was what the whole game was 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 based on essentially for junglers was like vi wukong who's gonna get their divine sunder if you don't have you know yours at the third fight and or the the, the second drake and he has his you pretty much just have to give everything so um i just think peach is just not it like uh, even when he was performing i just don't have faith that he will be consistent and be meta resilient and be able to you know be solid for a whole season i feel like he'll always end up having you know periods of time where he's just one of the worst junglers in the league where do you come down on this one peter because i noticed normally as a coach you always have like a different angle on junglers so what do you think of the peach angle like what did preach bring to their team or did he have any was he a glaring flaw at times what do you think i biggest issue the entire year is they were too afraid to make plays and one thing you could say about peach is he's never afraid i mean he doesn't execute the plays well he doesn't go for smart plays um but you know he he does go for plays i will say that there are a lot of very strong junglers in the erls right now like there's uh, i mean actually i could talk about junglers right because it's not uh, like I, I i don't care about junglers right like uh um but like uh you know, like linkers people like um uh maybe maybe isma there's there's a lot of like very 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 talented jugglers and there's also the best free agent on the market this off season which is going to be inspired right sure. uh, um and you know inspired goes you know if inspired was on excel or maybe let's say Bo was on Excel because Inspired's gone to Vitality or something, then, then you know, then that could be a big benefit. Um, yeah. Like, they need decisiveness on their team, though, right? And this I mean, is there's something... even technically self-made out there in the wild somewhere. And here's the thing about self-made. You know it's guaranteed he will deliver because otherwise the pizza's free if he doesn't get there within the first day. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. You get the job. I knew it was going to Okay. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Listen, I'll always give bad props to self-made. He's actually still got his hair and he's Polish and, like, in his mid-20s, so fair play. That's Jesus. already a W. So, you know, you got to take Ws where you can anyway. Going back, right? Oh, and Yanko still has some hair left. Why you got to do him like that? It's like the Daywalker, mate. He's got all their strengths and all their weaknesses. You know, like, exactly. <laughs> He's also a cool guy who's not argumentative. So, you know, I, I don't okay. even know. If he, I need some sort of, like, a Maury Povich. Is he actually Polish? You know, let, let me just check. Like, let's get the DNA. Let's figure it out. Is he, <laughs> is he, is he secret Hungarian or something? What's going on here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, bringing it all back. You are right. There's a lot of jungles out there. So basically, Peter, like if you were XL, obviously you don't necessarily want to give rivals advice, but as an observer, you think they should gamble maybe on a different jungle? Uh, if I were coaching XL, I would look at some of the other options. Not okay. saying outside them, I'd look at them. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> 
I do think, by the way, <laughs> not least, I mean, it's not just because of, like, the EG thing, but, like, people have just written off inspired in a really weird way. Like, this guy's a phenomenal player. Like, he might not have at times, I don't know, stylistically fit with someone in Rogue or something, but I would... De- to me, the inspired one's just like that whole VTO one. It's like, if someone doesn't give this guy a chance, you just blind me. Like, there's clearly something there where if, you, if you're if you the right team and you pick him up, he will be one of the best. Just flat out, come on. I mean, you don't even have to be on the right team, right? Like, Koi said all those things about him, about how he was, like, a dreadful fit and everything. And what's their worst position with Inspired? Like, third in the league? Yes. You know? That's the worst-case scenario, right? If we yes. go on what Rogue and Koi were telling us, which, you know, I, this guy's obviously insane. He's going to he's gonna come back to Europe, and he's he's going to get in the back next season. Yes. So I'm happy for him. Yes. Right, let's just go on to the team that beat them then, Tom. I want to get your take on where you're at on this Fnatic squad. Because I have to say... Part of it's because they did burn us so badly in the like playoffs, and they just they just weren't ever the team they were supposed to be. Like they on paper they were supposed to be in that final plane against G two, they didn't even make it there. At the same time, like I am glad this team made it to World Storm. At least this team has a fucking ceiling. At least they can have players that can pop off and actually show me something. They still have mad problems. Like I think this is another team, mate, where. I hope the Koreans aren't studying these games because it's so obvious in the draft what they can and cannot play on Fnatic. So if they can get through that fucking nightmare of the draft, if they get the right champions, this team at least can do something at Worlds, right? I mean, if we define do something, like, I'm, I am I can have very to hopeless. potentially be your ones. Yeah, upset of be a one. Like, I guess I guess the, the line for me is like, can you make it out of the Swiss stage? Right, like if that's okay. the line, right. then it's just like G two is the only hope I have. But if we're going for like upset some BO ones, like maybe like place higher than like a, a LPL team that's choking or like an LCK team that, that's not playing well. I mean, I think that they have the players to do it. The thing that's concerning about Fnatic is that they always so they always have these tragedies in their games. No matter what the game state is, they're going to have like one massive tragedy. Like before it was late game. Now, sometimes it's like around Herald. They'll just have like one massive mistake where if you're playing versus a better team, they're just going to take control of the game and they're not going to make that massive mistake into you um, later. So just throughout the split, I mean, we had times where, you know, you have humanoid roaming top and then you have at the same time as, as they're making a top play, you have Razor and Trimby go for some type of play and it obviously fails because, you know, they're a support in jungle trying to kill like a mid laner and, and people are, are are missing on the map. In this series specifically, I hated the way that they played around the fact that Noah was so ahead. Like if you get two kills on your Jinx at five minutes, he has to be involved in all the plays you're making. Like the fact that Jinx is that far ahead means that he can push the wave whenever, which means that Drake should be free and then Harold should be like free. You, you don't need to full swap for it. You could just like half roam up the river, just do what LPL teams do. You start bringing your AD carry and support. Enemy team has to call like the Harold situation off. You walk back bot, catch the wave. But he wasn't involved. And then I thought that Noah played poorly mechanically in, in, in some of the games. Like he didn't feel like that unkillable God AD carry that he, he, he was in like the regular season, for example. Um, so I guess those those are my biggest issues with, with watching Fnatic play. But yeah, it's really tough to see like some of the mistakes they make. I mean, they just make some really, really weird mistakes. The, so the game that, 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 that I'm talking about specifically, the, the game three, where they're 4-0 up. Trimby's just like randomly autoing the Drake to try to keep it aggroed. Enemy team starts Drake. They get off of it. Then Trimby just starts autoing the Drake to keep it aggroed. And everyone just jumps the wall and kills him. And suddenly he's just dead. And then, you know, you lose pressure in the game for that. Then you have the Herald situation where, you know, Poppy ults them out and their AD carry is not involved. So they lose Herald. So somehow we went from like a 2K gold lead pre eight minutes, which is an absurdly big lead to losing kills. And then also losing like the most the, the most major objective that you have in the early game, which is the Herald. So I, th- this is like my whole issue with this team is I just don't. I don't feel like the um I don't feel like they're consistently getting better week after week. It feels like they're just like hit or miss. And and if anything, it feels like they've kind of like um regressed a little bit from where they were in maybe their first games of uh, summer split. What I would say is that when you like listen to Fnatic's voice comms, uh they it's Trimby talking eighty percent of the time and like Razork 
and humanoid 10 percent of the time right uh may, maybe like 70 20 10 right well um uh, and there you know obviously we studied we study voice comms closely before games and you have team fights where noah is like trying to say something he's like uh, you know and nobody listens to him right like his right. voice is like hello look i want to do this or, or like my q q3 and then like everyone is shouting over him and nobody listens to him. um and you know uh, which I think uh, I think Fnatic signing Trimby this season is like one of the biggest deals that I've ever seen in LEC history. Like it's 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 not quite caps the G2 level, but it's almost that. It's almost that level uh, because yeah. it's so clear what he's brought to the team, right? Like, and uh, you know, all it will take is Trimby's a smart guy, right? So all it will take is for him to just adapt a little bit and you know pay more attention to he carries conditions as well as his own, and I think that they will be fine. They. One thing I will say in that Fnatic do throw a lot of games in the mid game, but faster bouncing back. So, you know, they'll find plays and, you know, against top Korean teams where you make one mistake and or top Chinese teams where you make one mistake and the game is over. Fine. You know, may, may, maybe there's no chance that they can beat JDG, but I could see them. I could see them taking games off. JDG. Or I don't think they'll win a best of five, but I could see them taking individual games. Um, so, so you uh, it's it's not impossible. They are very very aggressive. They're very decisive. I think Razork has a has a really impressive example. And sure, he does boneheaded stuff sometimes, but his he is probably the strongest jungler in the first three levels in the LEC. Um, so I, I mean that way. And I think that you know it's worlds. Humanoid will be fine at worlds. He's always fine at worlds. So yeah. I mean, what I always say about Razork is he's the type of guy he makes like five good plays and then he'll make one play that's so egregiously bad that it will undo all five good plays that he's made so like let's say every single time that he makes a good play it's like a 400 gold net gain like oh after it's all said and done he'll then make a play that'll be like 2000 negative and the game will be just dead even <laughs> at a point where it's like dude you had the whole game one like you didn't need to do anything i mean that's the best description of us that i've that i've probably had uh yep <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Razzok. But I, I will say the fact that he can play Talia jungle and you know he couldn't play Ivan uh, on thirty whatever patch it was in summer. He he only played one game. He didn't. It was okay. It was against us, but he didn't look insane on it or anything. But his Ivan got a lot better uh, coming into the Excel series. So you know they're a team that use their time well. They're very they're they're very um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're very uh, decisive. But you know I could see them losing games against Golden Guardians. Uh, who it's one that coming in right. Yes. Um, has he yep. played much? Look here. Uh, yeah, he's been playing. Okay, so so then then they're probably going to be BDS. But like, uh, you know, if they lose to BDS, I think that there's no world where like BDS can lose to Golden Guardians. But you know, there's a like five percent chance that Fnatic can lose to Golden Guardians, right? Uh, but yeah, there's you know. I I see people saying that our oh, Golden Guardians have like the freest entry into worlds. You know, these people don't watch the LCS, right? So <laughs> at least we're better than the LCS, right? That's what I would say. Okay. We'll get to that later. It's all good. Okay. The one thing I'll say is this. You're both doing that thing where it's like, <laughs> the, all I'm going to say is this is called arm up thinking. That's why I get really worried and like a little bit frightened when people do this, where they go, it's okay because he doesn't like kick in until later. Like, I'm not players in the playoff, and then I just saw him in a bunch of playoffs where he's a bomb as well. So you're all going, it's okay, because when Humanoid gets to Worlds, we all know what that's like. Mate, it better be better than this. I'll tell you that right now. Like, I don't think the LEC is very good right now, and this guy was not carrying any of these series, mate. He, and here's the other problem, boys. I don't just watch, I'm not like some fucking pleb who just watches LEC. I watch all the best Korean and Chinese mid laners play exactly the champion pool that Humanoid is playing right now, and they look levels above him. I'm talking levels. If they get the kind of Jace matchups he has, they would have like 12 kills and shit on the game. He's just all right on these champions. There's Tristana pulling out the Annie. Like, I don't know that any of these champions he's on the world class level. So my concern is there better be a world spot coming. Otherwise, forget all that shit I said about the upset. So that's not going to be I mean, there. There better be Oriana and Victor buffs coming. Not just the world's buff. Like, that, that's what he needs really badly right now. I just feel like well, these champions are not champion really. Pool. I mean, it's just not champions that he's historically been super good at like i felt like when humanoid was the best player he was just really insane on all these control mages like that's what he would he would take matchups that 
like I remember like it versus Larson, for example, in the first couple of games that he played um, the Victor Oriana matchup, he would just win both sides of the matchup. And, you know, that was just a huge point of strength for that Mad Lions team. I just don't think that he's like, he just doesn't seem like he would be a Jace player. If you think about how Jace actually like interacts as a champion, it feels like he's better at like controlling zones and like hitting and like finding times to hit multiple people with abilities than he is about like playing a, you know, a poke champion, for example. This is like the worst meta for him possible, right? Because it's all just on uh, these kind of things, right? Yep. Um, so, so you know, maybe it'll be a better meta at once. I mean, to to be clear, I'm not like putting my life savings in the Fnatic okay. basket or anything, right? But I, but I can see them, you know, they're, they're an aggressive team and I can see them getting surprises, right? Like BDS, I I think BDS are a very well-coached team, but they would really, really struggle to, to shock some of the... Uh, top Asian teams, but I could see Fnatic. I could see Fnatic taking best of ones. You know? So. Right, what about then? Let's move into some of the other ones. So, I actually think we don't have to go by, like, order. Let's do the G2 topic, Dom, like you said. Mate, bearing in mind G2 is probably still just going to fucking cakewalk this entire season finals, win this finals, get the fucking number one seed and go to Worlds. There better be some fucking hyperbolic time chamber shit going to happen in that boot camp, mate, because... I'm with you. This has been whack. Like, I don't even think the way they won the last split was super impressive. Like, it just looked like the other teams were shit. This first matchup against BDS was disgraceful, mate. Like, I, at this point, I almost feel like they just, they just never lose scrims or something. They look like they think they can't lose games at this point. Like, this isn't fucking world-class League of Legends. I'm with you, Dom. I wanted it to be that they're... Even if I think is not a good reason, they're so far above it. It's like, ah, who cares? They're the true hope, you know. They were down in our... They were mired in the mock of LEC in these games, man. This was messy as fuck. Yeah, it was, it was messy as fuck. Also, like, the, the thing about G2 was when you watch them, they always draft in, like ways that you believe to be suboptimal if you go off just what meta strength is around the world like if you have the same idea that korean and chinese teams have about like the strength of you know like alistar for example and and you know tristana jace Malka, like all these types of picks if you have that type of read then you think they're drafting suboptimally and in like game one for example they picked the cled into the renekton like i know that it's a bad matchup for for cled but BB's just winning it. So great. Like he, he's, he's winning the, the, the Kled matchup. Perfect. But then game two, they try to run the Eve in another spot where I'm like, wow, isn't this just a horrible Eve game? And it looks dreadful. It looks like it just solo loses the game that it's just such a useless champion that they, they aren't able to win. Um, and then it's like, wait, so do like, are they geniuses? And they have like a meta read that no one else has, or are they completely fucking lost in the meta? And then like the way that the games kind of broke out in that four game series is games one and three, they look like geniuses games two and four. They look, you know, like they, like they don't know what they're doing. And you're like, all right, I mean, I guess they stole one of the games they should have lost and they went three, one. I feel good about it. Like who feels good about watching those games? Broken. Say that again. You, we lost the first words. What do you say? What's broken? Saying, I'm saying is Cogmo Brom blind broken? You know, like they were picking, yeah. you know, they could, yeah. just pick whatever you want, you know, just yeah. pick. Um, I'm pretty sure I would just I would transition the question like this. That's the problem. We can't tell are they super geniuses because since everyone knows that story, as remains done a good job of marketing that every split they just like win all the scrims and everyone cancels all the scrims on them, right? If people want to be generous, Peter, then what they do in the last split, for example, is like you're saying, they just say, right, they're obviously so far ahead in scrims that they're not showing anything. They're just saying, right, well, basically until you can beat this Cogmore Brom, we're just going to pick it whenever we want and just fuck it. It's only a group it's only a gr group stage game anyway so who cares right but the more you see of some of the playoff games and stuff sometimes it seems like actually they just really do think that was the best like how much of yeah. this is like do they have like some crazy bag from scrims and they, they're still letting I, it I out just, or do you think this is their meta read i mean i just think that they're just going to be picking this cog brom blind and then when they go internationally blg or some of these like just asian teams are just going to be like oh you blind you blinded brom we're just going to pick Lulu plus Aphilios or some shit, and they're just gonna run over the whole fucking lane. Like it'll be impossible for the cog to lane. It hasn't happened in LEC, so maybe maybe the the Brahm is actually that OP, and and you can kind of lane with it. But I mean, Brahm is a champion that historically has a lot of weakness. Like you you can't really fight back into enchanters with this pick. Um, and you know for some reason, no one outside of like I guess the the end of LCK w was willing to actually play the enchanters. So. It's very weird to me watching them play. Like, 
I, I can't imagine that these picks are actually as good as they make them seem knowing what like other teams are doing and, and how they approach these types of like blind angles. Nobody in Europe like plays plays Bard that well. Like you could put Bard into Kogmo Brum is pretty insane. But like there's also you know I mean, they so were even picking into he's on their team. Yeah. So I, <laughs> forget that one. He's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but they were even picking into stuff like Rakan. Normally you can't pick Rakan into Brum, but they found a way to make it work. I mean what I would say though is with G two, there is a chance that they make other teams overthink, right? And you know, if you're gonna be worse than a Chinese team, it's worse than a Chinese team playing stuff that the Chinese team probably hasn't played against. Then try to play meta into them and like and just get stopped, right? You're not gonna win the game playing meta into JDG, right? Even if you're T one, right? Um so 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 I think there's benefits to this. I think that Playing with their food, it felt a bit like they were playing with their food in, in the BDS series. Uh, I'll be honest, like um... maybe game two, but then like by game four, I was like, wait, like this game is a game you should once again lose, and then you're going to game five versus BDS. So like I can understand that for one game if they like stomped games one, three, and four, but by game four, I was like, oh, I mean, I guess they won, but I just wanted more. I don't know, I just expected more. Uh, I mean, I will say they are insane in scrims. Uh, what, but. It's worth saying that G2 has the only best of series, like the only decisive best of series, because I think they lost like they were in lower bracket, right? But the only decisive best of series they lost all year was against Mad Lions, right? In spring. They've won literally every other series where when it mattered. So uh, um, let's see how, he, I mean, obviously this team is going to is going to win the league unless Elioria goes absolutely crazy like he did in that series. And I think it was Elioria and Chasey, right? Going really, really insane in spring. Um, yeah, but... I mean, I could see Mad Lions beating G2 if G2 plays in the same form. I thought Mad Lions' form looked improved. I, I mean, Kazi looked I... fucking banging, mate. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing about Kazi, right? Like, his team fighting's always been insane. It's just about, um, you know, laning, getting into that stage. But because sometimes he takes too many risks that he shouldn't take. But yeah, um, it, it, it's possible. But uh I'll see when G2 lose, right? When they when they get destroyed, uh, maybe maybe they'll push it too far. But I think this double elimination bracket really benefits them a lot because it means that they can they can pull out their cheese, they can look like geniuses, and then when they go into lower bracket, they can like sort of try hard, right? By the way, we'll one thing I do appreciate on Twitter is that even though obviously in the modern day you can get the PDF of all the votes for all pro and you can find out who voted for who and who put who like one, two, three, you know, you can, you can find out all the info you want, the ballots to get released publicly, even though to be fair, a lot of fans don't go and view them, right? Peter also always puts his on Twitter if people don't know and oftentimes if people ask him and he will even do sort of like mini AMA and reply like why he has this person over this person or whatever. So I want to get your take on this actually, Peter, because one thing I, me and Monty have been in agreement on independently but it turns out when we compared notes we're just on the same page on this one is when I look at G2 this year and obviously each of the splits in the matters were different but they've kept the same five man lineup and they have been the best team overall the whole year to me I would if I had to give MVP of this year the, it's easy I give it straight to Mickey X mate I think he has been so outrageously good do you have a different perspective is there a different player you would highlight on G2 as the best player Mickey is Mickey's the best player in the league by like a significant margin. Um and you know, I think I think some of the hate that Caps gets is completely overblown. I'm gonna be honest, it's 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 it, like he's he's not playing like twenty nineteen peak caps, but he's not bad. You know, he's still like one of the I, I had people replying to that saying he doesn't even deserve top four or, or pro which is insane. Oh really? Holy moly, okay. <laughs> um but like, you know, the for me, for me, it's it's just Mickey. I mean, I'm just trying to think who else you could maybe give it. Yike was good in was good in summer. Was really really good in summer. BB is has is kind of playing more weak side on that team. So I mean, and Caps is Caps has huge variation. So I mean, I think Mickey is just the best. And the the thing is, I think that's what gives them a chance, right? Like to to yes. me, I don't really care about the rest of the team, right? I think it's support is probably the most powerful role in the game right now. Um, since they changed the TP timers, uh, and you know that they have a really good support. 
so that will give them a really good chance of what. So. Yes. I'll even say, as much as we do this holistic thing where we're like, oh, look, these top Western teams have a chance. Spoiler, I'll make it really cynical for you guys. It was always just Mickey X and Hillisang teams. What are we talking about here? Like, even at the last Worlds, what, maybe the chance was Trimby because he has his own, like, unique champion pool. If you actually want to beat these Asian teams, I've always said the position they're the most far ahead at is jungle and support, in my opinion. Like those positions, because the other ones, like even like a 10 out of 10 mid laner, you could you know how they roughly will play. An 8 out of 10 mid laner can look similar and do a similar function. The support players in Asia are cracked out if you if you don't watch the LPL, etc. Like they are unbelievably good what they can do. And the thing for me that makes Mickey X OP on this team is, mate, he's the only support in the West where he doesn't have that bullshit excuse of like, Oh, he's just waiting for his meta. Next patch will be his meta. All the patches are Mickey X's patches. The patch where you play Nami, that's his patch. The patch where you play a Braun blind, that's his patch. The patch where you play his Thresh and all the healers and fucking Pike. Oh, they're, that's all waiting the whole time. Leo, that's it. There's no patch right now that Mickey X would be bad on, as far as I can tell. This guy's just fucking OP at his position. Yeah, I mean, I. I, mean, I, I his, his Heimer was like the best in the league when that was meta yeah, it came out of nowhere. He even played the Jarvan game at one point, if you remember. He was ridiculous. Yeah, I, and, and if I, it's I, not I, his patch, he'll make it his patch. He'll just start blinding Braum with Emacs, and then that'll be his patch. <laughs> I mean, exactly. Like, to me, I, I actually think he's not the best Melio in the league. I think his Melio and Yumi aren't that good, but you're never picking Melio and Yumi and blind into Mickey. He's just going to murder you. <laughs> like, so... So, yeah. So, so to me, that, that puts a lot of pressure on other teams to give counterpick to... Like he 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 plays well with other pick as well, so so yeah, so we'll, we'll see. I I mean I I don't necessarily think the best supports like I in the world is not a world. I don't think like Mako is in a world this year. So so you know we'll we'll see. Uh, but but yeah, uh, until G two until G two lose doing this in Europe, uh, you know I find it very hard to to judge against. You know like push push your limits, see what you see what you could do, uh, and. You know, maybe you'll end up with egg on your face if you lose to Mad Lions in, in the grand finals. But, uh, but you know, and you can, through testing your limits and draft, it doesn't just have to be inside the game. And obviously the Evelyn pick was complete garbage. It was like one of the worst Evelyn angles I've ever seen in my life, right? But, but you know, <laughs> find a way to get a good challenge. I mean, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I mean that that's the problem that I have with 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 these angles is like some like a lot of times I'm fine with you going outside of what the meta is if you're playing something that makes sense in the context of the game but sometimes they'll like this Evelyn you go into the game and we're like everyone in in the fucking sack we're just talking about it we're we're like this is just a horrible game like I would hate to play Evelyn here like all the junglers are like oh my god this is like a nightmare because you you can't assassinate anyone <laughs> it's the whole point of the fucking champion uh, so when they pick it, it's very hard to be like, oh, well, you know, I can see what they were going for. When when they pick something that doesn't make sense, I can't see what they're going for. Unless they just win things that, that you don't think are winnable. Like, I don't know when Kled is supposed to beat Renekton. Like, I don't see how that's possible. Like, if I think about the Renektons that I know, if you think about 369 Renekton, Bin Renekton, these motherfuckers are Renekton, I can't imagine them losing to Kled. Like, if they lost a Kled top in lane, like, are, they're getting fucking benched or some shit. Like, that is just not possible. But then... It just worked out, I guess, this time. So, I mean, they're just like rewriting the game, I guess. Let's do the, the fun one, which in my opinion is the BDS discussion. Because the problem is, if you want to make fun, there's always going to be obvious fucking gaping holes in BDS where you can just meme on them and the Adam angle and all the rest of it. But the one thing I'll say is this, as much as they did waste that window that they had in spring, where they really, I mean, they could have been the champions, they could have been at MSI, they could have had all these things and they missed, they messed it up, right? I never really thought they were actually that truly good a team. Like there was, re there was circumstantial reasons why they were on top. But at the same time, I don't think they've ever actually been bad. Like, even when the team had its struggles this summer, they were still all right. They were still decent enough. The core of the team was there. And they're certainly not, like, peaked yet. But bearing in mind, this is going to be a Worlds team. Like, it's not as bad as I thought. But the problem is, I don't really know what the bright spot is. Like, get, it's, it's, can you sell me on BDS, Peter? Is there a reason why I should have any faith in this team? Like, the problem is, when I look at the squad, mate, I just, even man for man, just look and it's like... I'm so scared of all these Asian top laners against Adam. I think they're just going to murk him completely. Chio's already hooked sort of a bit sus against bloody European junglers. I go and I look at fucking Nook and it's like, some days he's playing the Jace. It's like, wow, he actually has a champion. Then he just shows me another champion. It's like, he's actually not that good on the meta champions. Like, what's the angle on BDS? Have you, do you see a bright spot for them? 
he is a rookie, like in in fairness to Shio. Okay. I mean, he's a he's a rookie on a bad team. You know, I, I'm a big I'm a big Shio defender. Uh, I, I think he's had he's had a really hard like. I mean, it's it's not easy to be a jungler on on BDS. So the thing I will say about BDS is they will never lose to a team that's worse than them. Okay. Of all the teams in the league, besides the Madlands, I would say the BDS are the best prepped. For, like, did did you see the ward that they placed against SK, which wasn't cleared for? Right. Uh, like, yeah. or, or they will have, like, if there is a certain weakness in your game that you always default to, they will all be prepared for it. This is why I think, like, it's impossible for Golden Guardians to beat BDS. Like, BDS, like, it's, like, Golden Guardians are fundamentally flawed in a certain, about how they play their, how they play Vision in the mid game, especially on Licorice side, and BDS are never, ever going to let golden guardians get away with it right so so and okay. i think this this is the thing that i give credit to bds coach i don't know if it's coaching staff i don't know if it's analysts or whatever but they always understand how to beat the way that you beat bds is you have to like literally pull out something that they're not expecting or you right. bludgeon them with like so they're good at the win conditions basically right if you're a team that is worse than bds it is very very hard to beat bds right uh, like so, so I, you know, I think obviously we can't use JD as the barometer for everybody, right? Like, you know, even mm. when the Korean teams go play against JDG, they're going to get bludgeoned, right? Like, yes. so, so it's so, so what are we looking at for BDS? You know, if they're playing against the the top NA teams, they're playing against the wildcard teams. I think that they're going to beat all of those teams. They're not going to embarrass themselves. They're going to look solid, you know. And if they get a win against, I think it will be better for BDS is if they lose to Fnatic, because then they're get more time to warm up and you know so <laughs> they, can, they can beat an na team i know it's such a bad angle i don't want it okay it's mad is that's right. his version of trash talk basically where it, to you it just sounds like a weird quirky counterintuitive point but that's his version of trash talk it's actually better if they lose so then they just beat trash na and then they're in worlds <laughs> I, 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 no, no, but like the, 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 you get warm-up right like being in the players actually does yeah. number three seed start at the in planes as well they do right Yes, I think so. Yep. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say on BDS. I think that they've done... Or actually... Incredib- surely they- three seed starts and playoffs in planes. It must do, surely. I thought they, 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 I thought they changed it. Hold oh, on, really? Okay. Yeah. Rounds that some teams start in. Yeah, let me see. Uh, playing... Yeah, no, they they auto qualify. The oh, really? the play in okay. is um, or at least that's what it says here, right? The play in is, it's a smaller play in. It's eight teams. It's the one team from the world's qualifier, the NA or EU, and then it's LLA, Brazil, Japan, um, Asia Pacific, like PCS, uh, both PCS, I guess, and then Vietnam, uh, two Vietnam teams, two Vietnamese teams. Yeah. Uh- I think if BDS are in that group, it would it will not. But I mean, you know, it's it's all see the limitations of BDS. But I mean, it's worth saying that they were two zero up in a split finals, right? They were one. They had they almost mm-hmm. split finals. We almost saw Nuke and Adam at uh, MSI. Now we're going to see them at Worlds, right? So, yep. Fair. Oh goody. Right? <laughs> Respect. That's all. I, that's all I have to say. About <laughs> no, my perspective is not respect. The opposite. It's disrespect but permanently until you prove otherwise. So, and also bonus. They're French. So I'm, I'm like predisposed at this point in time to be the person I am, just to be a natural critic and hater. So whatever. Yeah, I mean, whatever. same. Are we just jaded, Peter? Tell us. Are, are we just jaded, or is the level of like LEC just way lower than what you'd expect? Because I mean, even on the broadcast, for example, Broxa was saying that like, you know, the level was atrocious of you know, the Fnatic XL series. So what is your take? I mean, I'll be honest, Dom, I think that you watch too much LPR. <laughs> like, I think it's impossible. Okay. Definitely. Like, it's, I mean, it's impossible not to be jaded if you just watch LPL, but I don't think LCK is that strong this year. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, it is kind, it, it kind of fucks you up watching too much LPL. Like, it just, <laughs> like, you just have, you be, you develop like an unrealistic standard for what you think yeah. teams should be able to do 
You basically get mad at people for not going for a play that you know is there, but they don't even know exists. And then when you realize yeah. it's not that he didn't know, it's not that he doesn't go for it. He doesn't even know it exists. You just feel like, unfortunately, this is the analogy. You feel like, wait a minute, I am asking like a little kid with crayons to paint me a Rembrandt. Like maybe I should just make, it, just make a house, you know? Yeah, fuck it. I know the guy's as big as the house and the smokestack's going the wrong way. Whatever, mate. Yeah, well done. It's going on the fridge. There you go. Shit. Sorry, Adam, it's going on the fridge, mate. You're going to Worlds. Well done. Fucking hell. No, that, that, that's how it feels. Like there's so many times where, like, even watching LCK where I'm like at eight minutes one team is starting Harold guaranteed like eight minutes somebody has an advantage and that team is starting Harold and if it's close at all like it should be a fight to the death it should be a straight up 5v5 if like supports are even levels and then I'll just see them like not start the Herald until 10 minutes and it will just make my like blood boil for some reason I don't know Yep, I mean, uh, you know, look, I coach in Brazil and I coach in North America, and I don't think Europe's that bad <laughs> compared to some of the things I've seen. Okay. So, like, exactly. So, so he so, made that sound uh, like he crawled out of the fucking bane pit or something. Like, like <laughs> 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 I mean, what's the problem? Seems it's a nice place to live. What are you talking about? It's true. Honestly, like, see a world where there are two European teams in the top eight at once this year. Like, uh, mm. uh, so. And, I can I see mean, one. Uh, I can't see two. I can see I can one. See two. I, I can't see where there's where there's fewer than four LPL teams, but I can see a world where there's where there's two EU teams. Uh, there's never been four there's LPL definitely... teams, right? It's never happened. In playoffs? No, I don't think so. I think there's always yeah. one LPL bomb at least, right? Yeah. Wow. It was LGD okay. in 2020. It was uh, it was FPX 2021 and and LNG in 2021, and then 2022. Obviously, you had it's the, the uh, top esports on. collapse. I'll do it. I'll say the cursed words that ensure we ruin worlds completely. I actually do think this is the world's where all four are making the playoffs. I know. Yeah. Oh, what are you doing? Yeah. Know, this is the one where these four showed, these four are actually <laughs> old enough where they showed for real. I mean, at yeah. least the top three. Maybe Weibo could like collapse, but like the top three looks so fucking yes. good. Yeah. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I mean, obviously, like comparing, if you're comparing Shio to Kanavi, obviously, like that's not a fair comparison, right? But like, you know, you have to start somewhere. And I think that this year, as a region, got better not necessarily at the top but as a whole right there were no complete teams this year right like even astralis mm -hmm. were you you know leader were, were were doing stuff right and i think that you know people teams that people thought were weak in the past teams like sk teams like bds really stepped up a lot and i think that fine for the future i don't know how it's going to matter for this world but you know the fact that the region at the bottom end, as the, like the average of the region got higher, and G2 can still clown on them. I think that's a good sign for us, right? Uh, and I, is that I don't think Europe is that weak. Like, I, you know, the worst thing you can say about for too aggressive, and you know, if you're too aggressive, sometimes you can you can just get wins. Like maybe Razor doesn't hit his one in you know one bad play. Maybe he hits three bad plays in one game and he gets 15 good plays in another game. You know that's how that's how numbers work, right? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so so you it's like Razor's law. I'm gonna just start calling it. I'm gonna coin it. It's gonna be okay. Razor's law. Like for every four okay. good plays, there must be one disaster. Something like that. We'll write it. Carry over the disaster into the next game. Is he allowed to have three disasters? All <laughs> oh, right. Can he? No, I think it has to be <laughs> in one game, and the one disaster has to bring the game back into equilibrium. Okay. <laughs> like that, that's basically, that, basically, Razork gets so far ahead, but then he blue shells himself. That's yes. the analogy to make it like an equalizer. <laughs> it's like a rubber band mechanic, but within his own game, basically. Right? Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. By the way, all I'll say is this. Bear in mind, they're now both technically going to Worlds. I don't care in what capacity. I'm willing to embrace the fiesta. I just want this one matchup to take place at least once. Please let me see the shy against Adam in a game. That's all I want is that. Now, here's what's fucked up about that wish, Dom. There's a really fucked up day where Adam actually wins that matchup <laughs> and the shy imps. And I'm so scared that that is what will happen. But at the same time, I want the day where the shy just mega gorilla uber stomps the whole game like gods are like oh, i want that game i want where adam's all pushed up all day long and then thinks he can dive the shy and it's like bro i've seen this one before the LPL. like he, the outplays he does is insane so like, i just need that matchup to happen once only once is all i need I'm, that's all i'm asking for i'm not greedy just give me that matchup once though especially because it, i i guarantee you adam will like try and banter him as well and like say some shit before the game oh man give me that adam game, probably please. doesn't even know who the shy is bro he he thought ukraine was china 
know, like I don't think he knows. Like... But that segment, the geography segment, was mad disappointing. I can't lie. I yeah, <laughs> no, it, it was it was it was actually really nice for me because you know I'm I'm from NA, so I'm always getting like <laughs> meme like, oh, do you have like yeah. NA geography? And then I see what these players like. They thought, and then the, the response is the best part. It's not even that he thought Ukraine was China. It's like, oh, in France we have different maps. No, what this, maps what do you have in France? That is mental. I know exactly. What, what on your the joke? Well, the joke there, Dob is on his map. Obviously, this is how he sees the map of League of Legends. It's just his little island, and then it just says there be dragons elsewhere. That's like, I guess that's the sort of map Adam was working up for. But there's no world in which in France they have a map, but Ukraine is considered part of China. Yeah, how yeah. old is this map? Is this like the, the Mongol Empire? Or what? what are you talking <laughs> yeah, about? You no. mad cunt. Like, that's, what, that's such a whack. Like, oh, like, like, he's making that sound like France is another planet, mate. Like, as all we like, I've been to France. And that's like, it's not like that. It's a European country, you, you. yeah. No, I mean, and also, like, the thing is, like, even before technology <laughs> and stuff, like, I, I read a book recently where they were, where it was like, it, it was a book about like, uh, um, the American Revolution in 1776, okay. and they were showing like the maps, the actual maps that were written of like Brooklyn and New York. And you can look okay. at it and you're like, damn, that's pretty fucking accurate. Like, that All is right. New York City, okay. like, everything is like perfect. That's in the, in the 1700s, so okay. I don't know what the fuck maps he's talking about. But anyway, yeah, please, I mean, <laughs> please just give me the shy versus Adam. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. I don't ask for much. That's, that's the one thing I ask for. It's the fiesta think, we all deserve. You have to understand ooh, that, guys. It's the fiesta I don't we know. deserve. I mean, the more I think about it, I think Adam could win. Oh, I don't want to believe it, though. I don't yeah, want to he, believe it. He could win. His champions are good. Like, the, the, the shy is a Cassante one trick at this point. Like, that's a Darius and, and Olaf angle. Exactly. I predict if that happens, what will happen is he'll go Renekton or something, and he'll go, and Adam will go Darius, and we'll see whether the shy has played into Darius and solo queue, right? Like, you know, yeah. I, I cannot imagine. Can you imagine Wavell Gaming banning Darius? Like, there's no way. Egos there's no will way. Never allow, there's no way. No. There's no way their egos will allow them. To and do surely the like, shy's the guy who says like, I can deal with it. You know, let it through or something. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> It's so actually right. It might even be primed for the upset in that scenario. Yeah, I mean, we we know it's gonna happen though. Like, we'll see this matchup. Everyone will get really hyped, and then a jungler will just come kill like one of them level three, yes. and then the whole matchup will be done. Indeed. I mean, the the thing the thing that is scary uh, for BDS though is it's obvious that Crowny is a major shot caller on that team. It's gonna be really hard to get advantages two v two, even three v three, but. Um, in AdWords. So maybe that will hurt their shot calling, but unless you are strong enough, like which NA team is going to go and punish them at Worlds? You know, like... Oh, there's none, mate. Yeah, I mean, there's none of them, right? None of them. I mean, yeah, even teams. the people who got hyped about NRG for this run to win the championship, one, that is one of the weakest championship runs I have ever seen ever in League of Legends. And two, they won with all these fucking ridiculous comebacks. Like, that's it. There's no, there was no strength projected for me. Like, I'm sorry, I don't want to hear it on LCS. But when I watch that final, I don't go props to NRG. I go, what the fuck were you doing, Cloud9? What, what did you even think this was? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, I just blame Cloud9. For, so if I look at like uh, the LCS teams, dude, none of them are going to do anything. I'm sorry, they aren't. They just aren't. But that's the thing. So for BDS to do, to like, so expect BDS to come to top, right? Like, I mean, I don't think anyone in it, right? So for what's a successful world for BDS, they come like 12th, right? Yes. And who's going to be 12th? Is it like maybe Cloud9? Like, but you know, they're 2v2 bot. It's not, they they win because Berserk is a god tier team fighter, right? It's not because he's like going to stomp you into the floor in lane. Uh, so BDS could be fine there. Like maybe they can lose the Vietnamese team, like some of these Vietnamese teams. But Vietnam didn't look that good at MSI, so maybe you know the region just looks because of, because of how they're playing. You know, like the teams just look good in that fiesta. So so you know, I could I, BDS are going to be fine. They're going to be they're going to do something which is acceptable to everybody at Worlds. They're not going to embarrass themselves, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And okay. with Fnatic, I think there is a. A two percent chance for that might embarrass themselves, but like, but uh, BDS won't. BDS will be fine.
Right, the main team we haven't talked about is Mad Lions. We briefly touched on it in relation to the XL series, etc. But I want to get your take on this, Peter, because obviously you have your own biases with the, the org and the players, etc. Right, the guy I have to ask about initially, though, normally I'm never the one on this side, but I've got to do it, me. I've got to be fair. If I'm going to flame the fuck out of Humanoid, how can I not flame El Yoya for how he played for the last, like, split and a half, mate? Like, if I look at all those games they were losing in Raw, dude, he's a big part of the reason why. These are some criminal games. Like, for me, he is supposed to be just the best jungler, in, like, except for maybe Jankos, the best jungler. He's always the candidate who's supposed to be right at that. Like, I expect a lot from this player. Like, to me, he's supposed to be the best Mad Lions player. What, what's your take on, like, obviously now they've resurrected somewhat, but what do you think happened to this guy? What, what was holding him back this summer? The worst performances I've seen from a player in, like, the Nocturne game. Was it against, yep, who was this Nocturne one. game again? Where he literally didn't, he just altered for Vision. He didn't like put in a single time in Nocturne in like a 30 minute game. Uh, to me, um, it's worth saying Mad Lions in the first two splits. I think how bad they were is massively overblown because they're called Mad Lions. If they were called S, were called Heretics and they were playing like this, like I think, you know, they, they got finalists in one split and they won another split, right? Then they were Temesai, they got blasted at Temesai. Can't lose a game in 16 minutes and 40 seconds unless you're trying you're trying desperate things to get back in the game, right? Like you, they could have they could have stalled out the game to 25 minutes, right? Against T1, it's just uh, they 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 were going they were going they they were going for a lot of desperation. But I mean, for me, they never really showed anything in summer. Like they knew they were qualified for season finals. They they did the bare minimum that was required of them, uh, which is Atlanta way, you know, conserve conserve. Do you believe intentionally they were sort of like sandbagging a little bit, or as you say, like just not showing much and knowing that like essentially we only have to get it together later? Because people do know from the interviews, Mac obviously cares about the idea that you get like a bit of a pressure release valve and you don't go hard every week, right? Oh, to me, there was no threat, right, on that, right? Like, like who, who is going to, like they were qualified for the championship. Uh, you know, they were always going to come up a bracket, right? So what do you get out of winning in summer? And... Uh, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't know anything behind the scenes, but to me, it looked like when things matter, actually play. And like, the difference between Mad and Summer and the 3 0 series they had against Excel was huge, right? Like they, they were properly prepped. They, they kind of knew how to neutralize everything Excel had. And, you know, that's what it's going to be like for the rest of the playoffs. And this is why we will see when Mad played G2 in upper bracket, we will have a good idea over how, you know, was it Excel being bad or was it Mad being good? But I, I, this is just how mad are, right? Like, and this is ever since Adoria has been on mad, it's, you know, maybe arguably the season before, it's always been like this, right? So, so when, when the chips matter, when the chips are down and when things matter, that's when we'll see how good he is. And obviously I think he's still one of the best jugglers in the league, right? Uh, uh, you know, as much as I love like Yike and Chio and what they've shown this season, right? Like they're, they're not at Adoria's level yet, right? So we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see what that means. Also, by the way, just in a random aside, I'll throw out there. Since obviously the year began, and supposedly El Yoya wasn't going to be on this team, he would, basically if they hadn't fumbled the bag, the deal was done to go to G2. He would have been the player instead of Yike on G2. Well, if people don't know, his contract ends at the end of this year. So if he has a good Worlds, this guy really can again potentially be like one of the absolute best teams in the West coming into the next year. Like he doesn't have to just be even on Mad Lion. So I'm actually very excited to see if he can close the year strong. Because this guy, I think, is a better player than this team, mate. Like, this team makes it work. And in the current land LEC landscape, they're all right. But, like, if you could make, like, a super team and El Yoya's your jungler, you're cooking with gas, mate. You can, you can really do something then. I, I mean, I think their bot lane's pretty good. Like, I, and I, I don't mean that in, like, a condescending way. Like, I think Kazi is really good at team fighting. And I think Hilly is Hilly, right? When Hilly's on, Hilly's the best in, in Europe. But he's, you know, it's 50 but the one thing which I will say, show which showed promise, is the problem Mad Lions had in summer. Is so many times they couldn't play the game patiently. They were just overforcing every single thing inside the game. And the fact that they can play LeBlanc Camille comp style and actually play without needing to fight. Hilly can see three people walking in front of him and he has a TP on his LeBlanc and they're, they're 4v5 on the bottom side of the map and he doesn't engage. And he just lets LeBlanc hit the top tower for 30 seconds whilst four people just walk past single line and he can go on any single one of them tells me that like they're they be fine there and actually you know if mad play properly and given everything you've said about it Julia, i think they're going to be they're they're going to be ready at once right i i i, I just don't think like it's not just because they're called mad lions doesn't mean that they're going to lose right it's it's irrational to think in that kind of way
Dom, come on. I can trust on you for a hate wrangle for Mad Lions at World Show. <laughs> come on, if, they, if I can queue you up for anything. You know, there's no way you're buying the idea they're going to make fucking ripples at Worlds. You're just waiting for the game where they never get cars out of lane. El Tracy <laughs> just gets his head smashed in. Like, fucking Nisky's just like, whatever, all right. And then nothing happens. Like, come on. <laughs> It's it's hard to watch them get the ass beating they just got at MSI and then have any hope for the team at Worlds because like I felt like that was actually like they had some winnable games they just don't look like they're the team that that will will close out like they just won't close out they'll be able to get leads potentially but the way that they have to draft in order to get leads makes the game so fucking difficult like if you want if you have to draft a Hillisong Pike just to be able to like win up until 15 minutes well then you're playing 4v5 after 15 minutes so like how are you actually going to win the game. I think it's really hard for them. Um, a lot of their strengths get exposed internationally. Like Niski is is not the best laner. He's really good at playing the map, but he's not the best laner. And it's really hard to play the map when you're playing against one of these freak Chinese or Korean players that was just going to cave your head in and lane. And uh, uh, right now, the champions that are good in mid lane are not even roaming champions. So like he'll probably have to pick bad matchups in order to even fulfill the identity that, you know, he needs to within his team. So it's really difficult, man. Like the more I, I think about Mad Lions, I, I don't have much hope for them. I just think that they're, they have too many potential weaknesses that like one of them is going to just end up cracking. Yes. Are you going to say something, Peter? Just a non-Asian team? Will they lose to a non-Asian team, Dom? Yeah, I mean, they'll lose to G2 if they play against them at some point. <laughs> They're going to lose. They lose can, can they lose to someone from LCS, though? That's the question. Can, can they, they lose, lose to somebody to from LCS? Game? Probably. Uh, probably not. Probably not. Because all I'm going to say is this. Here's how you get your heart absolutely broken if you're a... F First of all, I don't believe there are fans of Western League of Legends. I'll do the really hurtful thing where I just explain like what everyone knows is going on. What that means is you're an LCS fan, and when the LCS goes out, you just bag on to whichever the good of you team is. Oh, shit, did I say out loud? That's reality, bitch. And then, spoiler, the, that was never the other way around. But yeah, what about the time when all of you and EU... Yeah, it never happened, did it, though? So shut the fuck up. So really, there are no Western fans, but if I pretend this nebulous Western fans exist, here's the matchup that will kill you dead, is if Mad Lions play against NRG, and NRG just gets one of these, just catch this late game throw and win the game in a PO1, that will crush all... All your hope dead. Because the other thing about the whole NRG thing that I can't handle is this. Bro, are we just going to look at that roster on paper and go, this is fine, yes. Why? Well, I think I will put them against Scout and Tarzan and fucking shut the fuck up. Look at the line up on paper. On paper, <laughs> they should be like barely in the playoffs of the LCS. Like, there's no universe where their solo laners are going to be fucking rock'em, sock'em robots against like LPL teams. It's not going to happen. And then what yeah. do you think that's going to happen to that bot lane? Like, I like FBI. He's got a good flaw to his game. He's not going to do anything against fucking aiming elk. Like, how do I know team keep going? Like, Rula, like, these guys are just they're up here. They're not even turning that up here. They're up here. Go Gala, like, like... It's over, boys. It's over. I would say I am excited to see Palafox internationally. Uh, in, in a non... In a non... You and Palafox's mom are the only people. Why are you excited to see Pal? Go on then. Wait a minute. Let me... Wait a minute. Let me just strap in, Dom. You know what? Okay, let's do this for real. Let me not be... <laughs> okay, yeah. Like, What's the Palafox thing? Yeah, what, yeah, go on. Hit me with it. Why, why would I like to see Palafox play internationally against, like, fucking... You got... Mean, like, like, okay. like okay, fucking so the then, best players in the world. Come on, hit me with it. Come on. I think I would say is that, that uh, NRG, when they're good, they're good playing through mid. And okay. like contracts is willing to give up twelve CS. Oh, to, I like, forgot contracts is his boy from the EG days. I knew that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'm yeah. Bias. I've got it there. I've got the bias. Okay, keep going. Go on. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, to be clear, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to seeing Doku okay. internationally. But like Pal Palafox contracts, you know, uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll take a couple of games. I, I mean, just, I think contracts just... has the right mindset. Like he'll make some shit happen. Like he might lose you a game, but he'll he, he'll do shit. Like he's oh, the guy that level three will like look for. Yes. A fight and that's what you need to do like you can't scale i have more hope i guess for energy than cloud nine because cloud nine their their, their overall play style translates so horribly internationally which was, was which was the main comment that i was making on like face check and all my other like episodes when you watch cloud nine it doesn't feel like like they can ever beat a team that is better than them because 
they just don't make anything happen. They just rely on on showing up to a, an objective and just being better than them themselves mechanically, and then they just win the game through that. But they don't have any like set plays that can get them ahead. Energy has the ability to snowball a game. Like they can play a game where contracts just makes like two, three good plays, then the lanes are winning, and they can just you know close it out from there if they have a good draft or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Cloud Nine twenty sixteen TSM now. Yeah, like, pretty much. They're, 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 they're just sitting there. So they've got an LGS. But... They just, they just always have to outlay and be ahead. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I'm excited. I'm excited to see, to see energy. So, so, so I mean, yeah. we're talking to somebody who's hyped to see Brazil play every single international. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's very no. hard to. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. if, if it's happened eight times in a row, it won't happen the ninth time, right? Like, that's just that's just not how statistics work. Right? Like, you guys have to realize, one of the reasons okay. how Peter even got on these shores <laughs> in the first place all those moons ago when he was just some Brazil coach is he unironically has a sickness. He is one of these people. Like, I get why Dom <laughs> likes League of Legends. He just watches the best League of Legends, like LPL, and then he, anything else, he just flames and makes entertainment. Peter actually really enjoys all this shit. Like, he's in that yeah. Emily Van Kelsey Moser camp where if you say to them, like, as an offhand comment without even asking in advance Tom like ah oh, it's like in VCS and you just mean it for C she's like you don't even watch VCS and they'll be like oh yes um I've only caught half the VOD so far of the play like I was already talking yeah. like they're no, I mean <laughs> watch this show and twice <laughs> and when Peter watched collegiate when he was in NA he was watching collegiate games exactly. like it was like it, it was crazy I, I'm not, he's like whoa what do you think about this player I'd be like I I've seen him like twice in solo queue I don't even know that this like who this guy is <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, all I will say is, sometimes watching JDG stomp everyone into the floor, <laughs> like there's only so much you can enjoy. Okay. There's, uh... Oh, I can, I can that's watch where, it for That's where years. we're different though, Peter. That's where we're yeah. different. Because I have to say, I come from in the old school quake. And I've always loved it when a really world-class player just shit stomps like noobs, as it were, and just destroys them. Like, I never get bored of that, man. I'm just, I'm like, I'm like that fucking meme of like Kylo Ren, like... Bleh. Oh, I just want more domination. I want Michelle. I mean, uh, like I used to love it back. In the, I'll tell you what. I actually is a mad rant. That I never do about items. I actually hate that they took out all those like mega disrespectful items from back in the day, like, like Sword of the Occult and shit like that. <laughs> oh, I love that shit when my boy Nami would just be like waiting outside the Baron pit for some bullshit like Sword of the Occult kill that could throw the whole game. But if he gets it, Dom, then he's on like nine <laughs> kills. And he's just like unkillable. I love that shit, and that's like some anime level plot line for me. You know, I'm I'm all into. That. That. Yep. Oh, All about that. I love it even when the, the fucking those Western players every now and then get a bit hyphy and they have the balls to build like a med chise in some like questionable match. I'm like, listen, bro, I can see this going really badly, but fuck it, I'm with you. Let's just go all in. Let's live, let's dream the perfect dream that you're gonna get nine straight kills on this champion. But let's see, let's see if you do. Let's let's believe it's possible. Let's believe. Yep. <laughs> 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 Nothing to say there. By the way, before we end, I should ask you this though. You've obviously been fairly forthcoming and being willing to like raise L LCS, etc. So here's the problem. I have to get a check of how far down we're going on Cloud9 here. Like you were making it sound like all the teams that finish fourth in LCS LEC will beat the Golden Guardians, get the fourth spot for Worlds. Here's my question though, Peter. Of the teams, and we now know at least what the four is, but of the teams that are going to go for Europe, can Cloud9 beat any of them? Are you a hater in that so, sense? So, as in scrims, right? In European scrims. Because obviously, like at the start of the season, like I, I've seen I've seen the scrims, right? So so here, here's what I'd say. Um Cloud9, if Cloud9 ever get to mid to late game, they have really good chance. Team fighting is really, really good. But You mean they have Berserker the... on their team? That well, that's yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean they have this, I mean, yes, they have Berserker on their team. Those coaches <laughs> did a great job of that late game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> By the way, that he phrases it, you know, where it's like it could mean anything. It's like, wow, their team fighting is really. It's like, no, they just have Berserker. But okay, let's let's continue. Let's All right, next point, Peter. We've I'm, done I'm, too many of these shows. I just know what you're saying at this point. <laughs> okay. See, I like the problem I have is always that whenever a team comes out of NA and plays really passively, they you you just can't. The game is uh, uh, like Hillisang or Trimby will not let you play the game slow. Like, I could see them beating BDS, um, but there is, I think it's really hard for them. Like, Fnatic are really, really chaotic, and sure, they may catch a throw, but in the best of five, it's hard for Cloud9 to beat them. 
because they've spent the entire split just playing to win games. They they like they what did Cloud9 do this entire year to get better? I mean they just just decided, okay, we're going to coast and we're going to win games. Like at least G two, I see them picking Claire and Evelyn and all of this nonsense, right? Like like at, at least I can see what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to things fresh, keep the things entertaining and things like this. And for me, that's my problem that I have with Cloud9. I would put Cloud9 below Fnatic. But CBDS being ahead of Fnatic, right? But I think matchup stylistically, like, I think it will be hard. And I'm really high on NRG, but I think NRG could take games. I think, like, NRG Fnatic will, will be so fun to watch. Like, both of those, like, Razork versus um, Contracts, those guys will, will... We may see new... Uh, we may see like P dot level two flashes over dragon pits and things like this, which is yeah. Which we, is... we might see like nine deaths out of one of them in like twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that 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 will be fun, right? So so I'm I'm not that high on Cloud Nine. TL, I can see TL winning games. Like TL definitely, you know, Summit. If they play through Summit prop for JJ Worm stop and things like this, I can see them. I can see them. Uh, I can see them taking some wins, right? So, but but we'll see. Cloud Nine spend their boot camp. Just practice psycho style, right? And then they come into worlds, and every game is twenty minutes. So. Yep. Right. Yeah. Here's the thing, guys. Didn't happen all year, but this boot camp will be the the unlock, the the thing that unlocks it all. Perfect. Obviously, this isn't just a weekend tournament, and it's not going to be over. Like, there's going to be multiple more weeks of this shit. So get ready to strap yourself down, like Malcolm in fucking Clockwork Orange. With the make yourself watch these. Guys. Ah! I don't want to watch any more league, please, Dom. Like, no, you have to. And we will be back mm -hmm. to talk about it on a future week. So see you then.